Good evening. My name's Evan and welcome to Rockland Graves. Halloween Ends is just a few months away and with that continues my series of videos reviewing the Halloween films which are canon in the current continuity. I've covered the original film, so now it's time to take a look at the film that wasn't the first requel, but is definitely responsible for the huge influx of horror requels we've had over the last few years. There were nine years between Rob Zombie's Halloween 2 and the next entry in the franchise, so let's see if that wait was worth it. There were a few Halloween films rumored to be in production after 2009, one of which being a third movie in Rob Zombie's timeline that would have been called Halloween 3D, and it would have been in 3D. Zombie would not have returned for the film, and it would instead have been directed by Patrick Lussier and co-written by Todd Farmer, a duo responsible for a movie that I fucking hate, My Bloody Valentine 3D. Scout Taylor Compton was contacted and told that filming would begin without having a finished script, she understandably turned that down. The movie even had a release date of October 26, 2012, but at this point, Lucier and Farmer weren't even attached to the film anymore, so there was a release date for a movie that not only didn't exist, but didn't even have a creative team attached to it. Doesn't that sound awesome? The other notable possibility was Halloween Returns. A full draft of the script for this movie was actually leaked and detailed Michael being on death row and escaping during his planned execution. It was written by Patrick Melton and Marcus Dunstan, with Dunstan also lined up to direct. Interestingly enough, Halloween Returns would have also been somewhat of a requel, ignoring everything after 1981's Halloween 2 and taking place in 1988, 10 years after the events of the original movie and the same year Halloween 4 takes place. Alright, look, this movie doesn't sound as disastrous as Halloween 3D, but it was ultimately cancelled in 2015 when Dimensions Films lost the rights to the Halloween franchise. In 2016, it was announced that Blumhouse Productions and Miramax were co-funding a new entry in the series. Mike Flanagan was approached to direct, but he instead opted to work on Hush, which ended up being a fantastic movie. Mike Flanagan is one of my favorite names in the world of horror, and I've loved every single thing he's done, so I'm curious to see what a Halloween film would look like in his hands. The film eventually got its creative team with David Gordon Green as director and Danny McBride as co-writer. The pair was mostly known for comedies until this point, but they seemed to have a genuine love for the franchise and sounded like they really wanted to make a film that would satisfy Halloween fans and pay homage to John Carpenter's classic. Carpenter was even brought on as an advisor and would eventually agree to compose the score for the film alongside his son Cody Carpenter and his godson Daniel Davies. Once Jamie Lee Curtis signed on to reprise her role as Laurie Strode, this movie started to seem pretty legit. Carpenter was very positive about the script, and things all seemed to be going well. It looked like we may finally be getting a Halloween film that not only understood the original, but was made by a team of passionate Halloween fans who wanted to breathe new life into a series that had fallen so far from its peak. The movie was finally released on October 19th, 2018, and quickly became the most profitable slasher movie ever made. But financials are only part of the story, so let's take a closer look at the final product of Halloween 2018. The film opens in Smith's Grove Sanitarium, where Michael has been in captivity for the last 40 years after being apprehended for his little temper tantrum in 1978. Halloween 2018, as I said before, is a requel, because reboot isn't fun to say anymore, I guess. The only film canon in this timeline is the original 1978 film. Not even Halloween 2 is included, and there's one major change that comes from that, which I'll get to in a bit. Aaron and Dana are journalists working on a piece on Michael Myers. They're being shown around by Dr. Ranbir Sartain, who took over for Michael's case after Dr. Sam Loomis died. Man, these two must be working with some major production if they were no, allowed to- case. Sorry, what was that? It's a pow case. What? It's a podcast? Yeah. No wonder there was a huge breakout in the original. This place is the worst security protocol on Earth. Aaron and Dana are seeking to interview Michael, but he's in timeout and he's embarrassed about it, so that's a no-go. After getting a nod of approval from Sartain, Aaron reaches into his bag and pulls from it the iconic Myers mask. I borrowed something from a friend at the Attorney General's office, Michael. Yeah, all right, these two definitely make veiled threats to get what they want. Hey, look, I understand. You work at the Attorney General's office. You want to keep your job. But here's the thing. One day very soon, we're going to be making an episode about ourselves. And if you give us the murder evidence, your name won't even be mentioned in said episode. Got it? Things get pretty intense when Aaron tries coaxing Michael into speaking or reacting to the mask. Say something, Michael. Say something. 
This may get no more than a small turn of the head for Michael, but some unseen force seemingly overtakes all of the other inmates. Michael and the mask on their own may not exude anything, but put the two together and there is something much deeper going on than meets the eye. The yelling builds, sirens blare, and as Aaron makes one last effort in getting this taciturn fella to speak, we cut to the title card and that classic theme kicks in in all its glory. For the first time since Halloween 3, we have an opening credit sequence focused on a jack-o'-lantern, this time being shown in reverse decomposition, symbolizing this film returning to the roots of the original and revitalizing a franchise which had become rotten. The opening sequence is an effective reintroduction which feels ominous and chilling thanks to the droning synth and gentle blowing breeze of this brisk October 29th, and it's punctuated so well by the build-up to the classic theme and opening credits. While I do think this is a solid introduction to the movie, it's unfortunate that Aaron and Dana are extremely underdeveloped and underutilized. We never really learn anything about how successful their podcast is, aside from Dana briefly mentioning that they won a few awards. Aaron and I have made several award-winning public radio exposés. Our last project shed new light on a murder case from 20 years ago. We know nothing about their relationship to each other, although a deleted scene does seem to imply that they're an item. We don't know anything about their past projects or really anything about their characters beyond the fact that they're making a podcast. I mean, we, we don't even know what the podcast is called. I mean, Aaron is recording some of it while driving and holding the handheld recorder against the steering wheel. This would sound like shit. I feel like them being podcasters was just added into the movie to try and ground them in the year 2018, but it just doesn't work very well. They ultimately end up feeling like a plot device to get Michael's mask back into his hands later in the movie, and they don't contribute really anything beyond that. I'm not saying they need to be super fleshed out and realized characters. This is a slasher movie after all, but considering a lot of the first 40 minutes of the movie is spent with them, their inclusion is a lot more shallow than it could have been, and the podcast element will probably just hurt how the film ages as time goes on. Anyway, their next stop in making the podcast is to get an interview with the one and only Laurie Strode. If you ask me, it may have been a better idea to just skip Michael altogether on the interview side of things because he makes GTA Online characters seem annoyingly talkative, but hey, maybe they just wanted some of his patented breathing for a backing track. Lori is quite reserved with the duo and only lets them in once Dana bribes her with a grand, although I feel like that's chump change for Lori based on this high security compound she calls home. How does $3,000 sound? This is the second incarnation of Laurie that we've seen following the events of the original, and it's quite different from the portrayal we saw in Halloween H2O. In that film, Laurie had run away and changed her name, landed a job as the head of a preppy private school in California, and had a son named Josh. She was haunted by that fateful night in 1978, but overall managed to live a relatively functional life, albeit aided by medication and grown-up fruit juice. This version of Laurie, however, has not fared as well. She lives alone on a quiet road in a heavily secured house, and it's revealed that she lost custody of her daughter at a young age and has a very strained relationship with her and the rest of the family. She's become a hardened survivor whose life became devoted to preparing herself and her daughter for what she views as the inevitable return of the boogeyman. Lori acts as somewhat of a surrogate Dr. Loomis in this film, often speaking of Michael on a mythical level similar to how his doctor always did. I believe in Michael Myers, a deranged serial killer, but the boogeyman... Well, you should. She doesn't see Michael as human, but instead as the incarnation of evil which his doctor so deeply feared. This is something that I've missed in a lot of the later Halloween sequels, and it's one of my favorite aspects of the original. Dr. Loomis's monologue to Sheriff Brackett is the perfect example of how Michael should be portrayed, and I've never been a fan of how the movies tried to overly clarify and explain his motives. I don't mind hints towards certain draws Michael may have, but to give a flat-out explanation leaves no room for mystery or intrigue and makes Michael far less frightening. I spent eight years trying to reach him, and then another seven trying to keep him locked up because I realized that what was living behind that boy's eyes was purely and simply evil. I'll talk about Michael more later on, though. This scene's meant to highlight Laurie in the state she's in. Laurie is reserved, single-minded, and standoffish, but her fear of the boogeyman is the most prominent and controlling aspect of her character. Following this scene, we're introduced to Karen, played by Judy Greer, and the rest of her family as they're having... Oh no, 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 God, no, they're having breakfast in a Halloween movie. I see only one bastard in this house. <laughs> Give me a fucking break, he's probably a queer. He's gonna grow up, end up cutting his dick and balls off and changing his name to Michelle. Oh, Elvis, Elvis, oh, oh. Jesus, 
videos, I'm gonna break it again on your fucking face. Enough, all right? That was it. Oh, mother! Oh, man. I got peanut butter on my penis. They're all nice guys until they get you pregnant, and then you gotta drive in their pickup trucks, and you clean their guns, and you got children, and you clean guns, and you like to get high with them, and then y'all get fat. Hey, Dad. What? Can you stop? Well, this is new. All right, yeah, this must be what people are talking about when they say this doesn't feel like a Halloween movie. The cast of Halloween 2018 is one of its strongest elements. I really like the characters in this movie. Karen has distanced herself from her mother, both physically and psychologically, trying to focus on the good in the world instead of subscribing to her mother's very dark worldview. Speaking of subscribe. Her husband Ray, played by Toby Huss, is a very likable, goofy suburban dad, hell-bent on making his wife and daughter as uncomfortable as humanly possible every chance he gets. I know some people have problems with the humor in this movie, but it really doesn't bother me. I actually quite like most of it, aside from one moment that I'll get to later on. Karen and Ray's daughter is Allison, played by Andy Maticek, who seems to be carving her way into the world of horror quite comfortably. If you haven't seen Sun, I highly recommend it. Allison is similar in some ways to her grandmother. She's an honor student, hangs around with sarcastic and airheaded friends, prefers the back left corner of the classroom, me too. Allison wants to have a closer relationship with Lori, but it's difficult both because Lori is so focused on Michael and Karen makes no effort to see her mother and seems to be actively trying to keep Lori and Allison separated. She lies to Allison about inviting Lori to a dinner, but Allison knew she lied as she had reached out to Lori herself and asked her to come. You said that you'd oh. invite her. Right. I did. You did? Yeah. So my mom's a liar. What happened? She said that she invited my grandmother tonight, but she didn't. I mean, she never even contacted her. How do you know? Because I called her myself. It's a fantastic scene that does a great job at showing how strained this family's connections have become, and it's actually pretty heartbreaking to see how poorly Lori's coping. One of the things that makes this scene so impactful and revealing is that this dinner is to celebrate Allison making it into the Honor Society, and it's also the first time her family's meeting her new boyfriend, but... Lori can't make it 30 seconds in without downing a glass of wine and breaking down crying. Speaking of Allison's boyfriend, let's get into some more of the peripheral characters. Cameron is played by Dylan Arnold and has a really cool connection to the original film. It turns out that Cameron's father is Lonnie Elam, the kid who bullied Tommy and was scared away from the Myers house by Dr. Loomis. Hey! Hey, Lonnie, get your ass away from there. One thing this film does really well is weaving itself into the world and story of the original movie, and this gets even better with kills, but we'll save that for the next video. Earlier on, we were introduced to some of Allison's friends on the way to school and some shots reminiscent of those in the original. We meet Vicky and Dave, played by Virginia Gardner and Miles Robbins, respectively, a couple who kind of remind me of Annie and Lindsay in some ways, but I'm not sure if that's intentional or just my Halloween fanboy brain going berserk. Vicky allows some of this OG Halloween blood to get into this movie as she's babysitting a young boy named Julian on Halloween night. Julian is played by Jabril Nantambu, and this kid is absolutely hilarious. Apparently most of his lines were improvised, which is really impressive. I, I know you're talking about smoking weed. Don't lie to me. That's against the rules. I'm telling my mom. Well, I'm going to tell your mom about your browser history. You better not. If I had some other kind of babysitter, she'd be reading me a story. I wouldn't be up clipping my nasty-ass toenails. I saw this movie in the theater on release night, and I remember the whole crowd just laughing hysterically at any time this kid was on screen. Vicky and Julian have a really sweet relationship that feels genuine and adds a good bit of charm to the midpoint of the movie. We also meet Oscar, played by Drew Schkeed. I hope I'm saying that right. There are a few more characters worth mentioning, one being Officer Frank Hawkins. He was present for Michael's capture in 1978, and it seems to be hinted that he and Laurie have a history. He becomes hell-bent on killing Michael once things kick off, and he apparently stopped Dr. Loomis from killing Michael 40 years ago, and now regrets doing so as the shape takes more innocent lives. There's also Sheriff Barker, but this guy is the worst sheriff I've ever seen, and he does, let me think, absolutely nothing. I'll have more to say about this guy in my Halloween Kills video. Overall, we have a solid cast of characters in this movie. They're all likable and have a charm to them that's missing from a lot of modern slasher films, even if some of them are underutilized and are there mostly to pad out the body count. I think Cameron has the most puzzling inclusion. Allison catches him kissing another girl at a school dance, which leads to them fighting and Cameron throwing Allison's phone into a bowl of melted cheese and then he's never seen again until the sequel. I do appreciate his connection to the original movie, I think it's really cool, and Dylan Arnold does does a fine job in the role, but he just 
serves as a method for Allison to lose her phone in the third act and doesn't really contribute anything beyond that. Granted, he does get a lot more to do in Halloween Kills, and while that's great, we had to wait three years to get a satisfying arc for his character. Again, Dylan Arnold does a great job playing the charming boyfriend who quickly turns into a complete asshole when he's drunk, but before we had Kills, this just felt like an odd inclusion whose sole purpose was to make it so no one could contact Allison and warn her about Michael. Speaking of Michael, the Boogeyman is as frightening and intimidating as ever in this film. Following the first movie, no portrayal of the shape could quite match what Nick Castle did with this killer. For this film, James Jude Courtney was the one behind the mask, and he's easily the best Michael since the original. His movements are calculated without being robotic, almost moving like a cat hunting its prey. If I would have one negative with this version of Michael, it would be that he doesn't really get much time to be the boogeyman in this film. There are a few slow building suspenseful scenes, but in terms of the stalking, ghost-like figure Michael was in the original, there isn't too much to speak of here. For the most part, he's either front and center in a scene, or he's not in it at all. Again, I love what this movie does with Michael, I just like to see the phantom stalker we saw in the original, especially because I don't think any of the sequels captured that very well, save for maybe Halloween 2. He's more violent than he was in 1978, but it doesn't feel excessive or over the top. Say something. Yeah, Alright, may maybe aside from that. The kills in this movie are gruesome, but it doesn't get into Rob Zombie's Halloween 2 territory and feels much more in line with how Michael would be after being locked up for 40 years. Some of the kills genuinely disturb me on release night, particularly Aaron's death in the gas station bathroom and this woman's death during what is probably the best sequence in the movie. It starts off super strong with some great shots of kids trick-or-treating with lighting that perfectly encapsulates the feeling of Halloween night. Michael makes his way into this garage, grabs a hammer, walks into this lady's house, kills her, grabs a kitchen knife, and begins making his way toward a baby's crib. He doesn't kill the baby, but I remember not being sure if things would go this way, as we already saw Michael kill a kid earlier on in this movie. Side note, the baby crying that we hear in this scene is actually Jamie Lee Curtis. You ready? Yes. <laughs> that? No, that. All right, all right, you think that's cool. Watch this. Michael proceeds to a neighboring home and brutally kills this woman by smashing her face into the table and stabbing her through the neck. This entire sequence is done in one shot and it captures so much of what I love about Halloween. The lighting, the costumes, the way Michael moves, and of course, the music. I've been waiting for the right moment to talk about the score in this movie, and I'll do that in just a moment. The biggest change to Michael's character in this movie is his relationship with Laurie, and it's thanks to the retconning of Halloween 2. Michael and Laurie are not siblings in this new timeline, and yes, I said that was thanks to the retcon. I prefer Michael to be mysterious, and I've always found that the familial aspect of the character makes him less frightening. John Carpenter came up with the idea in a moment of writer's block six beers deep into writing additional scenes for the TV cut of Halloween, which needed to be slightly longer to fill a TV slot, and he then added the idea into Halloween 2. That girl, that strode girl, that's Michael Myers' sister. She was born two years before he was committed. Two years after, his parents died and she was adopted by the Strodes. He's been very open about how unhappy he is with that change, and I'm glad to see Michael return to this mysterious boogeyman with unknown motives. On the other hand, I think Halloween 2 is, is an abomination and a horrible movie. He's scarier this way, and it adds to the almost ghost-like nature of the character. Alright, I can't wait any longer. I need to talk about the score to this movie. John Carpenter returned to do the music alongside his son Cody Carpenter and godson Daniel Davies. I'll just go right ahead and say it. The music in this film is the best since the original, and it's not even close. It may even be the best score of the whole franchise up to this point. The score ranges from the haunting atmosphere of Laurie's theme to the horrifying aggression of Michael Kills Again. Prison montage perfectly gets across the unstoppable force of nature of Michael returning after 40 years and the inevitable horror which will follow. The highlight has to be The Shape Hunts Allison, which accompanies Allison's first encounter with Michael. The score is one of the best in horror history, proving that even decades later, John Carpenter is still unmatched in this department, and I'd love to see Cody Carpenter and Daniel Davies compose more for film if this is the result they're capable of achieving. On top of the movie sounding great, it's also extremely well shot and directed. The overall look of the film is almost elegant, with slow moving and intentional camera work. Sequences like the bus crash discovery show off some fantastic cinematic lighting with the headlights beaming through the fog in this great wide shot, and Oscar death scene has some of the most chilling shots of Michael we've seen. 
The colors and texture present make for a great visual experience, and it really shows how much a good director and good cinematographer can elevate a movie with its visuals. David Gordon Green is an extremely talented director, and the little details he scatters through in the background make subsequential viewings fresh as you pick up on more of these. As an example, I always thought Michael driving was only implied in this movie, but we actually do see the shape behind the wheel pulling in beside Aaron at the gas station. I love those little subtleties you may not even notice on your first viewing, and even all these years later, I'm still noticing more and more of these in the background of certain scenes. It's just a little unfortunate that most of this stuff going on in the background is only in the first 40-ish minutes of the movie. I would have liked to see some of this carry on throughout the rest of the runtime. So the movie looks great both in terms of lighting, framing, and motion of the camera. It's also paced very well, never really dragging or feeling bloated. It's a slow burn, but in a good way. The movie takes its time to introduce you to the world and its new characters and lets these scenes breathe instead of feeling like it needs to get right into the horror elements. Hell, Michael doesn't even get his mask until nearly halfway through the movie. It's an entertaining watch that still hasn't gotten old four years later and I don't see it happening anytime soon. In terms of plot, things are fairly straightforward. This is a back to basics Halloween movie. No cult of thorn, no familial connections, no white horse, and sadly, no Busta Rhymes. Trick or treat, motherfucker. I guess whoever's in charge here has never seen Halloween 4 because Michael's being transferred the night before Halloween. If you'd only done your research, you'd know this is not destined to go well. Lori clearly was more thorough in her research and she has a bad feeling about the transfer. She knows exactly what time it's set to happen and she plans on being there. Before she does, however, she shares a great scene with Allison where she gives her the bribe money from Dana. Fuck college. Go somewhere. Go to Mexico. Could you imagine? Yeah. I really like this scene. It adds depth to both Lori and Allison's characters, as well as giving us a better idea of how Karen wants Allison to lead a very straightforward and more normal life because of how intense her own childhood was. Don't worry about your mom. She will freak. But she'll get over it. She grew up learning how to fight, set traps, and was taught to always be on guard. Her life was centered on paranoia, and this rigorous upbringing led to Lori losing custody of her daughter and Karen trying to distance her own daughter from Lori while also trying to free herself from the fear that she was raised in. It's a little unfortunate that this monologue is delivered in such a flat manner. I can see what Judy Greer was going for here with the revisiting of childhood trauma. She's not a bad actor by any means, so I just don't think this scene translated very well. After Allison tells her grandmother that she needs to let Michael go, we get more confirmation that Lori cares more about killing the boogeyman than she does about having a strong relationship with her family. She goes to Smith's Grove with a gun, clearly considering killing the shape then and there as he is loaded onto a prison bus for the transfer. It's a haunting scene thanks to the fantastic rendition of the classic theme, the damn convincing Donald Pleasance impression from comedian Colin Mahan in which Dr. Loomis is on tape talking about the only way to deal with Michael and the performance of Jamie Lee Curtis as she watches as this take place. Following the dinner scene, a father and son on their way to a hunting trip discover the prison bus crashed on the side of the road with the Smith's Grovians walking around in a scene reminiscent of that shot from the original. This scene is a great example of David Gordon Green's affinity for interesting and engaging side characters with great casting to match them. The kid is really into dance and his old school father has a hard time understanding why that takes priority over hunting in his son's life, but doesn't bash the kid for it. Seems like he's really trying to understand and is willing to hear out his son. You don't, you don't enjoy it? I, I like being out in the woods. No, I enjoy I, it, but I'm missing dance class for this. And I love how David Gordon Green can very quickly establish these side characters and give them a lot of depth in a really short amount of time. The father leaves the truck to go see what happened, and after a while, the son leaves to go find him. Uh, I'll go get my dad. No. Run! Multiple bodies are discovered, and after impulsively shooting Sartain, the kid runs back to the truck where he's surprisingly killed by Michael in an homage to Annie's death from the original. Michael's a whole new beast in this movie. The shape is still able to drive in this film, and he uses the truck to drive to Haddonfield to track down Aaron and Dana at a gas station. He can be seen killing a mechanic in the background as Dana asks where the bathroom is, and two dead mechanics are eventually discovered by Aaron. Gotta love Christopher Nelson's makeup effects. Dana is attacked by Michael in the bathroom, and when Aaron comes to try and help, the two are killed off in a brutal sequence. I'm not fully ruling out Aaron surviving this, as we don't really get any definitive proof that he's dead, but we'll just have to wait and see. Michael is now finally able to reunite 
associate with his iconic look, and man, again, Christopher Nelson just knocks it out of the park. This is easily the best mask since the original film. Michael is now free to carry out the rest of the night in the only way he knows how. This is when we get that great scene I talked about earlier, as well as meeting Julian as Vicky babysits for him. Now, I mentioned earlier that I actually am a fan of the humor in this movie, and for the most part, that's true. There's one moment here where I find the humor does take away from the tension and the intensity of a scene, and it's really unfortunate. Vicky is tucking in Julian, and he asks her to close his closet door. She can't get it to shut, and Michael jumps out and attacks her. It's a great moment, and it would have been heightened if Julian was believably scared. Instead, he's written in a humorous way, and it takes away from the scene for me. This is the biggest example of the humor just not working, but aside from this, I don't have any major issues. We actually get to see a very caring side of Michael when he saves Dave from some very serious relationship troubles. You see, Dave told Vicky that this would be a night they'd remember for the rest of their lives, but Dave smokes so much weed that he can only retain memories for about seven hours, so Michael steps in to ensure that Dave can keep his word. Bro. You're, you're a fucking lifesaver. Leading up to the release of this film, we were told that Nick Castle, the original Michael Myers actor, would be returning to play Michael in certain scenes throughout the film, but his involvement ends up being a little less prominent than some would lead you to believe. Castle does play the shape in this shot, but this is the only moment where he's the one behind the mask. He also returned to dub the breathing from Michael, which is a nice touch and adds some more authenticity to this movie. Following Allison's first encounter with Michael, in which we get the phenomenal track The Shape Hunts Allison, she runs to a nearby house to find help. There's a nice touch here. In the original, Laurie did the same, but was ignored. In this film, Allison is helped by the first house she goes to. Maybe Karen was right after all. The world is not a dark and evil place. It is full of love and understanding, and I'm not letting your psychotic rants confuse me or convince me otherwise. The police are called, and Frank tells Allison that he's going to take her to her family. Lori has been collecting the family and is planning a standoff at her home, but they couldn't call Allison because she'd already lost her phone in that tragic cheese bowl incident. Now, this is where things get a little funky. Sartain comes with Frank and Allison in hopes of finding Michael along the way. Frank speaks about how he stopped Loomis from killing Michael in 1978 and how he regrets doing so, but Sartain is not on board with Frank's clear intent to not let Michael live through the night. I'm not going to stand in the way of justice this time. Remember, he's property of the state. He mustn't be harmed. Oh yeah? We'll see about that. Allison spots the shape, and Frank immediately runs him over with the police cruiser. He's seen Zombieland, so he gets out to follow rule number two, but Sartain attacks him? He stabs the deputy multiple times with a bloodborne transforming weapon, and then... Uh, g what? G what is happening? So he, like, he drags Michael back to the car, and... Oh, thank God he took the mask off. Yeah, this is easily the worst part of the movie. <laughs> there are hints throughout the film that Sartain is obsessed with Michael, but even with those, it feels like this comes out of nowhere, and not in a good way. It looks ridiculous when Sartain dons the mask, and it feels weird to have Michael get help. What makes it even worse is that it really doesn't amount to anything. The film doesn't commit to this at all. Sartain continues his way to Laurie's house slash compound, hoping to get Michael and Laurie together again. He's obsessed with what drives Michael and wants to see it in action, see what the allure with Laurie is. Allison manages to convince him to pull over the car by telling the doctor that Michael spoke to her, and Michael retrieves his mask, hulks his way out of the car, drags Sartain out, and does his thing. Say something. I never learned to ride a bike. Anyway, that's as far as that plot line goes, so on top of it coming completely out of left field and feeling really awkward, it's also totally pointless. It's another cheese bowl moment, and it's only there to get Laurie and Michael together for the finale. Sartain's death is awesome, and I love how terrifyingly strong Michael is while smashing the doctor against the steering wheel. It's not the worst thing I've ever seen, but it's definitely the low point of the film. But hey, at least we get some more really cool casting choices with these two cops, one of which is played by Sir Christopher Nelson, one of the most prolific and talented makeup artists working in the industry, and the man behind the effects in this film as well as the rest of the trilogy. The other cop is played by a real-life detective whose focus was on human trafficking and homicide investigations. Holy shit. They're another bit of comic relief in the film and I love them. Okay. Chocolatey homemade brownie. I made that myself. 
That's that's like what a five-year-old would eat if they could make their own lunch. Yet another example of how good David Gordon Green is at writing these minor characters. And with that, we have finally arrived at the climax of the film as Allison escapes the cruiser and makes her way toward Laurie's home. I know I've already basically spoiled the entire movie for you, but if you haven't seen it and you still want to preserve at least the ending for your own viewing, now's your warning. Laurie, Karen, and Ray are all held up at the compound, preparing for Michael's arrival and waiting for Allison to show up when Ray notices a police cruiser on one of the security cameras. He goes outside to get an update from them, and we get a gruesome showing of Michael's sadistic creativity that we saw glimpses of in the original. Must have been pretty cool for Christopher Nelson to create a jack-o'-lantern out of his own head. Ray's an absolute gem, so of course he gets away completely un- No! 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 The struggle tips off Lori and Karen to Michael's arrival, and Lori bars the door and sends Karen down into the secret room under the kitchen I am only now mentioning. Michael bursts through the door and begins to strangle Lori through the window, but she manages to escape by blowing off two of his fingers when he very smartly grabs the barrel of the gun. He made a mistake here, he just can't quite put his finger on it. Lori briefly joins Karen below as Michael searches for them, and we get one of the best shots of the shape we've ever had the pleasure of witnessing. Lori seemingly shoots Michael through the floorboards, and after a moment of silence, she makes her way up the stairs to finish the job. She searches through the house, systematically closing off each room so he can't hide in them after she's checked. What exactly does she do for a living? We get a cool little nod to the original when Lori checks the closet inside the mannequin storage room that every house has, and discovers Ray's body stuffed into the top shelf. I just miss him so much already. Michael then jumps out from behind one of the mannequins and a brutal fight ensues between the two. Lori ends up getting stabbed and thrown over the balcony when Allison arrives, distracting Michael just long enough for Lori to blatantly rip him off. Grandmother! Hey look, I think it's fair use, but apparently that doesn't fucking matter these days. Grandmother! Okay, look, I have ignored this up until now, but what the fuck are you doing? Why are you calling your grandmother... Grandmother? There are so many names for grandmothers, one of which is literally gunk, and you somehow managed to pick one weirder than that. Anyway, Karen quickly brings Allison down below, but Michael never skips arm day and begins to pry the counter which hides the stairs away. It's taken a while for Karen to do anything remotely cool or noteworthy in this movie, but we finally get something as Michael is trying to get to them. Karen eyes the rifle from her childhood with her initials carved into it and takes up arms in a move which goes against everything she's built her life around. Michael finally breaks through and she baits him by pretending to be giving up out of fear, only to shoot him directly in the neck when he reveals himself. It's a really powerful moment where Karen has to use the training she went through as a child for the first time to protect her daughter. Credit where credit is due, Karen. Well done. Another neat little detail is how Karen is wearing a Christmas sweater on Halloween. It's a subtle way of showing how she just mentally skips the holiday altogether and goes right to Christmas. Side note, it's interesting to see how the dynamic between Laurie and Karen shifts during the climax of this scene. It's honestly pretty sad to see that the first time we see them working together and relying on one another is when the threat of death is directly in front of them. Karen and Allison have both been telling Laurie for years that she's being paranoid and needs to let Michael go, that they don't need to be worried about him, and in the end it turned out that she was right all along. It's a bit of a shame that the film doesn't explore this more because it's a really interesting situation. Lori and Michael begin one of those pan v fire poker fights we're always hearing about, and Michael is knocked down the stairs and into the shelter below the kitchen. James Jude Courtney gets to once again show off how good he is at playing the shape, while first Allison and then Karen make their way up the stairs. Karen pulls a lever which reveals this room's final purpose, trapping Michael in the basement as Lori fills the room with gas and retrieves a flare, lighting it and tossing it below as Michael stares up at the three generations of Strode women, and a fantastic synth rendition of the theme begins. Lori has rigged the whole house to burn, and as it does, Karen and Allison help the matriarch to the road where Allison flags down a passing vehicle. The house is engulfed in flame, and yet when we get another look at the basement, Michael is nowhere to be seen. The film ends with the Strode women closer than they've maybe ever been with each other, and a slow zoom on the bloody knife in Allison's hand leads to the end title. This is a film that I really liked the first time I saw it, and I've grown to love over time. 
It's not a perfect movie, but it does a lot right and it feels like a logical continuation of the series which successfully brought this franchise back from the ashes in spectacular fashion. Tone-wise, I can certainly see why some people say it doesn't feel enough like the original. Michael is less of a boogeyman than he was in that film, but I'd also argue that none of the sequels captured that in the way the 1978 film did. This rendition of Michael is by far my favorite after the original, and the same can be said for the score. I can understand why some people prefer the blue lighting present in the 1978 film as opposed to the more more amber color palette we have in this film, but there are moments in this movie that perfectly capture the feeling of Halloween night better than most movies I can think of. I need to reiterate how much I love this sequence in particular. This shot to me is exactly how I remember Halloween night looking and feeling when I used to trick or treat as a kid, and so while I can appreciate that people miss the blue lighting, and I also would welcome a more faithful looking sequel, I don't really have any issues with this look. Tone-wise, this movie's a huge step up from anything we've had in a really long time. The ominous feeling that emanates from certain sequences is great, and the characters do a great job at investing me in the world even if some of them are underdeveloped. The overall vibe of the movie is solid, getting across that brisk fall feel that oh so speaks to my spooky little heart. The film is also full of references to the original, like the jack-o'-lantern opening, Allison's seat of choice, the PJ Soul's voice cameo as Allison's teacher. I understand someone who has nothing left in this world. Lori standing outside the window, similar to how Michael did in the original, Lonnie Elam, Judith's grave, multiple Halloween 2 references in this sequence, silver shamrock masks, another swap with Lori and Michael's place, and so many more that I won't even bother listing them all. It would have been easy with all of these nods to have the film lose its own identity, but this thankfully is not the case. This is a sequel that does a great job paying homage to the franchise while still having its own identity, and the end result is great, even with the flaws. It does more right than wrong, and it did so well at the box office that two sequels were quickly greenlit by Blumhouse. The ending of the film was left just open enough that it could continue if the movie was successful, but also just conclusive enough to be a definitive ending if it wasn't. So there you have it. Those are my thoughts on Halloween 2018. Before Halloween Ends comes out, I'll be taking a look at the sequel, Halloween Kills, which continues on the same night and was a far more divisive entry. I'm really excited to make that video because I have a lot to say about Halloween Kills, but for now, I appreciate you sticking around to the end of this excessively long and nerdy fucking video. Thank you for stopping by Rockland Graves. I hope you've enjoyed your stay.